Next up, John Bucknell. Thank you very much. Uh, I promise to make it right about 25 minutes so that uh, you know, I'll get to dinner. Um, so like the few uh, presentations before myself, um, a lot of what we've had is ideas on how to implement in space infrastructure, lunar infrastructure. And this is a, a study I did based on uh, the rock repulsion cycle that uh, if you were at the Drexel uh, Congress in 2015, you might have overheard me. I apologize, I really literally had to phone that in because I was uh, a little bit under the weather and on my way to Europe. So this is an extension of that. So I'm gonna review uh, a little bit of what that was. Let's see if I can figure out which way to advance. Um, this uh, is a, a mission analysis rather than a, a, a technical design presentation, although there is some technical design in it. We're gonna talk about the rocket cycle itself, which is called a nuclear thermal turbo rocket. We're gonna talk about the mission and how it performs. We're gonna talk about lunar in situ resource utilization um, and then an orbital hab. Um, just for interest sake, um, this is a, a Stanford Taurus. It's a, a one RPM uh, Taurus, um, so it's quite large. Um, the habitat I'm gonna talk about is about the biggest I can design using um, a rocket architecture that uh, we'll talk about and I'll, I'll make a few conclusions at the end. Sorry, can everyone hear me okay, or is that a comment? Okay. Um, so obviously, all the software development is uh, economically constrained. Uh, what we need is a launch performance device, or a high performance launch device to get uh, material in orbit so that we can do this infrastructure build out. Um, this recently proposed uh, rocket cycle is an air breather. Um, also, uh, it's a nuclear thermal rocket. And the big difference between this and other uh, launch devices is that uh, it improves the payload fraction, which is what you really care about, um, by a factor of about 15 to 18 over state of the art. And the state of the art is um, something that I actually have some knowledge about. Uh, I was uh, the lead design engineer on the Raptor engine for SpaceX about five years ago, so just this is my background, so just a little, a little side note, this is what I'm comparing myself to. Um, the other fun thing is that as an, a nuclear thermal turbo rocket is also a nuclear thermal rocket, it also performs very well for in-space propulsion. And for in-space propulsion, the reactor is just a heater. So give it any liquid, it'll heat it up and spit it out the back, which makes it fairly agnostic to uh, propellant, um, which also uh, marries favorably with uh, in-situ in research utilization. And everything I'm going to tell you about um, isn't new. Um, this is just a... Um, a uh, um, a mission to place a, uh, an orbital habitat that Anthony Zeppero and Joe Lewis proposed about 20 years ago. And uh, even worse, uh, there is a movie in 1950 called Destination Moon, um, whose technical director and screenplay was some another famous science fiction author that you might have heard of, Robert he Heinlein. So this is a single stage to uh, lunar surface nuclear thermal rockets. So um, nothing I'm talking about is, is very, fairly new. So interestingly, the big question about uh, if this video will play, is it playing? That's my clicker. Can somebody uh, run the video? So it turns out that NASA's been looking at the moon quite a bit. Uh, this is a picture of the South Pole. The Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter actually was trying to figure out what's down there. They shone a laser light on the, on the South Pole and they measured how much that light was reflected. So only shiny objects are gonna reflect back. And also because the moon is tidal locked, there are areas of the moon that are you know, in shadow permanently. So the bottom is actually quite cold. So these little glowing dots are surface ice, as that's what they think. There should be a paper this fall uh, talking in some detail, but that's, uh, that's what we think is going on on the south pole of the moon. So now a little bit of review. Uh, the nuclear thermal turbo rocket is long, long description, a supercharged air augmented nuclear thermal combined cycle rocket architecture. Each of those words means something. Um, I refer you to my 2015 paper um, to talk about the details, but I'm gonna review it real quick here. Um, again, since the nuclear thermal rocket's already the highest uh, in space launch capable rocket propulsion systems, um, you, it's a good idea to combine that with uh, hypersonic turbine combined cycle systems to get the highest average uh, specific impulse. Uh, and of course, this rocket combines both modes. So why is air augmentation important? Um, nuclear thermal rockets are already uh, pretty good compared to hydrocarbon and hydrogen rockets for specific impulse. They're between 900 to 1,000 seconds depending on how hot you make the propellant. 
but they're really fairly poor as compared to air breathers. Uh, your commercial airliner that you might have flown here on, it's probably running in the 3,500 to 4,000 second range. So uh, we'd really like to approach that. And certainly uh, hydrocarbon systems don't perform as well as hydrogen systems. Um, in this case, the NTTR uh, flies as an air breather all the way up to Mach 14, and its specific impulse looks like this, so quite a bit better. Um, and above Mach 14, it's a pure rocket. So uh, other air breathers out there, like Skyline and whatnot, stop air breathing about Mach 5, so they have to go rocket uh, the rest of the way orbit, which is a challenge from a payload fraction. Um, here's a neat uh, picture that gives you an overview of the schematic. Again, this is a single gas path, um, multi-mode rocket. It is both a rocket fan, a ramjet, a scramjet, and a pure rocket. So four modes complete in a single system. Um, the enabler here is uh, a reactor that superheats your propellant and spins it through a rotor with uh, rocket-driven fan blades around the periphery. Uh, at low speeds, it's able to compress the air coming in um, this way and push it through the combustor and out the back through a variable geometry nozzle. Uh, this system is on the center line of the, of the rocket that fuels over here the propellant. And as it uh, goes faster and faster, it, it uh, has a variable geometry inlet for uh, shock control to manage the combustion in here and also variable geometry on the outlet so that it can vector um, thrust as well as uh, change the throat geometry for best overall performance. So the fun thing about all this is that designing an air breathing rocket, uh, figuring out the best trajectory is quite a complex process. Um, what I started with was a uh, uh, air, uh, air breathing access quarter for some, some prior work. Um, and these are called uh, dynamic pressure isolines. So if this is free stream Mach number here on the x-axis and altitude in thousands of feet on the y, you want to maintain uh, a, a maximum um, dynamic pressure so that you don't burn up your, uh, your rocket. And then as you go up, it gets thinner and then you don't have enough air uh, to make your system work. So you can see the system um, starts as a rocket fan up to Mach 3. Uh, turns into a ramjet uh, up to Mach 8, and then as a scramjet to Mach 14, at which point uh, you don't want to continue to bore holes in the atmosphere, so you do a pull-up maneuver and continue your acceleration to orbital velocity as a pure rocket. So that's a, just a, a summary, and that's the big reason why the performance of this rocket's um, on average ISP is better uh, than when I first proposed it uh, two years ago, because I was able to do a, a trajectory optimization and, and figure all that out. In retrospect, it seems fairly, fairly obvious, but it took a little bit of computational effort to figure that out. Um, a brief review of the reactor itself. I'm using a, a miniature uh, thermal uh, reactor. Um, it's a um, very high-performance reactor that was designed um, in the late 90s. Uh, it has a, a radial gas pass. So each of these pressure tubes, which are lithium, um, have let the low-temperature hydrogen in one end and then have these uh, perforated foils arranged radially, so the propellant flows radially inward and out the bottom. Each of these is an individual uh, rocket, so it's an assemblage of, of many of these. And the biggest factor is that if you want to add radiation shielding, you want to have the outside dimensions of your reactor as small as possible so that your reactor uh, shielding mass is minimized. Um, so for interest, uh, for this mission, I propose a six gigawatt reactor which is 2,500 kilos, but that's out of a 22,000 kilogram um, package, which is mostly shielding. And the reason for that is that um, I'm sizing the shielding to only uh, radiate the payload at 0.035 rads per launch. Um, for background, your terrestrial background radiation is going to give you about two-tenths of a rad on the surface of the Earth. And if you fly commercial airliners and go up to 35,000 feet frequently, you're probably about two or three rads per year. Um, so really quite low compared to um, what you're going to experience on the surface of the Earth. Uh, the other big thing about these nuclear thermal rockets is you can trade specific impulse for thrust. Um, you can run the temperature way up. In this case, I'm running it up to 2,700 uh, degrees C for really high ISP. Or you can crank it down and crank the pressure up uh, to get much higher thrust. So you can about double thrust. Um, and also, you can run the reactor power up and down. So I'm running a 50% power case and a, and a full power case here um, in comparison. All right, so what's a six gigawatt reactor look like? This is an assemblage of 1,100 individual fuel tubes. As I said, those each are full scale uh, rockets themselves. So you can subscale test at full scale. So you can run one of these pressure tubes uh, in your test stand and get a tenth of a percent of full scale 
um, without having to build the full rocket. How big is it? Just over a meter in diameter. Uh, nuclear reactors are quite power dense compared to chemical rockets, so you can make them quite small. Um, the one gigawatt reactor that I proposed two years ago is only a 700 millimeter right circular cylinder. So um, just like rocketry, uh, reactors scale very well. So for a six-fold uh, six improvement in uh, performance, you're only roughly doubling the, the dimensions. Um, here's a schematic of uh, the, the, the shielding arrangement. So up is toward the payload in the, in the, in the propellant tanks. You have a very thick um, tungsten carbide gamma shield. Uh, and, and in front of that is a lithium hydride boron trioxide um, neutron shield. So those are all to reduce the payload um, um, radiation exposure. The sides in the back also have a, um, a roughly a, a two inch versus a, of, of tungsten carbide, which reduces uh, ground observers and launch, uh, launch observers from, um, from radiation as well. But like most rockets, you're not going to stand near it um, during launch. So if you're at that minimum three miles away, you're actually going to get zero um, total exposure from the reactor. Okay, so another uh, point of com comparison. This is a Block II uh, Falcon 9R. Uh, so 1.1 1 .1, uh, million pounds at launch. And if you count everything that gets in orbit, so uh, you can get 26,000 pounds of orbit, uh, payload in orbit, which is a, two and a, a little over 2.5% of uh, that gross uh, liftoff weight is payload. So that's about the state of the art. I think they're a little over 3% 3, 3 with the, the latest variant of the Falcon 9. By comparison, um, a three uh, meter diameter NTTR, which again from two years ago, is quite a bit lighter and it's getting about double the payload because its uh, average ISP is about 1,700 seconds during launch. So you're able to get about a third of the total mass to orbit. Now, cranking it up even bigger, 11 meter diameter uh, rocket with a six gigawatt reactor starting to get about the same magnitude of, uh, of gross liftoff weight but because the aerodynamic drag and everything else is getting better, we're putting 300 tons in low Earth orbit. So a much bigger, more powerful uh, rocket. And the reason for that will show up in a second here. So this is just a, a schematic uh, drawing of what it looks like. This is Australia. And the reason you see Australia upside down like this is that we're heading uh, toward the south pole of the moon. This is just a repeat of the, the prior, but um, again, Almost half the mass is payload from a low Earth orbit. Um, this uh, launch vehicle is a robot. Uh, it's going to go on a very low energy trajectory to the, to the moon. Um, Buzz Aldrin has talked a lot about cyclic orbits. Um, this is only uh, 13 kilofoot per second delta V, so um, not quite half of, a, of a, a high energy trajectory. It takes about 26 days to get back and forth. If you put anything on this orbit, you get uh, about once a month um, close uh, close pass to, to uh, low lunar orbit. And that's just for reference on how much energy we're spending uh, to get there. So because we want to get as much payload to, to Luna as possible, we're going to use the lowest uh, possible um, payload for, or lowest possible energy orbit. Um, for interest sake, we're dropping um, quite a bit of mass in low lunar orbit. What we're dropping is the orbital habitat, which is the payload of this thing, as well as the, the, the tankage to get there, and only leaving a little bit of the, the rocket behind, which is going to drop on the surface of the moon. Again, um, about 60 kilopounds worth of tankage, and 160 kilopounds worth of uh, payload, which is the, uh, the habitat, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So this, if you remember from the video earlier, the, there was a quite a large crater right near the south pole of the moon. This is Shackleton Crater. Um, it's quite large, and if uh, you can see it, I'm going to drop my rocket right down in the middle of it. <laughs> and uh, we're going to drop a 160 kilopound uh, payload right there on the surface of the moon. So we're going single stage all the way to the moon with a, quite a substantial payload. So in comparison, we're starting off um, 1.3 million pounds, and we get all the way down to um, uh, 200 and 20,000 pounds went all the way to um, the moon, and we're dropping off payloads in several locations. So this is what it looks like once we get to the moon. We have uh, what's the remainder of our rocket with uh, a water tank on top. Uh, we have two inflatable water tanks that are basically double the available payload. 
and some uh, astronauts for scale, although this is a robotic mission, so there are no astronauts, just to give you a sense of scale. And then our uh, robotic uh, mining operation here. Um, again, upside down, Earth, if you're north, northern hemisphere centric, so this is the South Pole. Um, so once you're on the South Pole, well, what do you do with all that water? Well, it turns out um, you're going to use it as both propellant and structure. Uh, when you're using water, and we're going to run it up to about 1,000 C before it exits the reactor, you get about three times the thrust that you did um, with hydrogen, but you're paying for it. Uh, you're only about 20% of the specific impulse. But the good news is that you don't need a lot of specific impulse when we're just doing uh, round trips to low lunar orbit. Um, so here's the, the, when we're full of water, we're going to um, leave the, the, the moon with 2.8 million pounds of, of mass. So we've filled up quite a bit with water. Uh, it's very dense, and we can deliver to low lunar orbit just under 1 million pounds of water after burning quite a bit of it uh, to, get to get there. And then you need a little bit left over to come back down because they're going to come back and refill. So um, I only need to run at about a third, uh, third thrust to get back down again, and I even left a little bit of margin uh, to land it. So every trip from the surface of the moon back up to low lunar orbit, we're taking a million pounds of water. Now, how are we getting this water? Well, we have this uh, roughly 30-foot uh, diameter uh, nuclear-powered robot. Um, and the, we're getting the water from ice sublimation. So we're going to run a very powerful uh, microwave uh, to get all that water. Um, suppose I want to build uh, my orbital habitat as fast as possible. I want to run, again, I'm going to change units on it, 719 tons of propellant per day. That works out to be about eight and a half kilograms per second, and I want to raise the temperature of that water by, by about 200 C. To do that, I need about six megawatts of heat into the water. And we assume our coupling of water uh, to the microwave is only about 50%. Uh, NASA's done some studies recently, and they can probably get about 90% coupling, but I'm going a little conservative. You need to put about 12 megawatts into your magnetron. And with a thermal efficiency of your reactor of about 40%, you need a 30 megawatt reactor on board. Um, it's actually quite small. Um, you only need um, a couple of tons to do that. So I've dropped uh, 72 tons on the surface. Uh, the robot is the vast majority of that. And you can see the, um, the breakdown here, and I need a crane to get it off the top of the rocket. But uh, these are all uh, radiators to reject uh, the, the waste heat. So what you do is you're, you're raising the temperature of the, the water up to just a, as freezing point. Then you have a chiller plate on the underside of this uh, robot as it drives around that's going to collect the water, and a little bit of that waste heat remelts it in a tank on board. So this is just um, artwork, but uh, you get the general idea. So now that you have um, water in orbit, what are you going to do with it? Well, you're going to build an a, um, a ice ship out of films. You have two films, one inner, one outer, and these are at either end of uh, your ice core. The outer film is, uh, is silver. It's only a tenth of a micron thick, but the point is, is that it's very reflective in the visible spectrum. And because it's highly, visible, uh, highly reflective in the visible spectrum, and you have um, a, strength, a high strength inconel layer behind it, you're able to uh, reject heat even in direct sunlight. So you're not going to melt your water. This uh, technology was actually developed for the space shuttle for coating their radiators that are inside the payload bay so they could uh, reject heat even in uh, direct sunlight. So what you get is a stabilized ice temperature of between minus 40 and minus 80 C. Um, and this ice is about a meter thick for this habitat. Um, the inner and outer both have um, PBO, which is a commercial name Xylon, which is a relative of um, Ar Aramid, which is 1.6 times the strength of, of Kevlar. With ice, you need to worry about creep. Um, so you have to have some amount of strength on the inside and out outside layer so you don't have that ice creeping around on you. And then last, you need Teflon protection because PBO degrades in ultraviolet light. So you're using your ice water as both radiation shield and structure for your habitat. So that's your habitat once it's been inflated. As it turns out, um, rockets are mostly like tin cans. They need to be pressurized to be stiff. So just like your um, soda can, uh, you use a little bit of bleed off your reactor to pressurize the tankage as it, as it goes up. We are actually run at about four atmospheres. So once this tank gets to low lunar orbit, all we have to do is open a valve and the inner diameter of the torus is going to fill up 
with uh, autogenous um, pressure in it, which is hydrogen, and it fills it to about a tenth of an atmosphere, which is more than enough to make a nice rigid torus. And then you have a meter of water all the way around with uh, these thin um, films on either side. So as we add water from every round trip of the rocket, you're going to fill up the, uh, the OD, and you have uh, quite a large uh, habitat. It's uh, 214 meters on the major diameter and 21 meters on the minor diameter. So how strong does your habitat have to be if you're making it from water? Well, as it happens, uh, there's some good data out there um, for ice uh, water, and the minimum strength uh, is about 1.8 uh, MPA. And I'm going to spin this at 3 RPM to get full terrestrial gravity, because a lot of things in space don't work um, unless you have gravity. Um, I don't know if you've looked at you know, taking a shower or using the bathroom on this International Space Station, it's not pleasant. But the analysis says it's your only maximum strength, uh, maximum stress is only 1.2 MPA. And this is a 40,000 ton habitat just for the ice water. Um, so you've got a safety factor of 1.6. Some people might argue that's a little marginal, but um, it's, it's not bad from um, other engineering projects I've been on that have run lower than that. But even with a uh, a thousand pounds per you know crew, you still can have a one and a half safety factor, spinning at full terrestrial gravity. If it doesn't work out well, you can spin a little bit slower. How big is this thing? The interior volume is almost two hundred thousand cubic meters. That's ninety times the size of the International Space Station, about six hundred times the size of the biggest Bigelow inflatable habitat. Um, if you had four floors with four meter roof height, it's about fifty-seven thousand square meters. So. Um, that's quite a lot of area, um, and if you wanted to be crowded, you could probably put 2,000 crew up there. I would suggest starting out a few hundred, maybe five or 600, but 2,000 crew would be reasonable. Um, and also, as you're running very cold uh, ice as your, um, as your wall, you need to uh, insulate the interior to keep it warm. Um, I've allocated 70,000 pounds of payload for um, a cryogel, aerogel insulation. Um, even still, you need about 500 uh, or th about 300 watts per square meter on the inside to keep it warm, um, and that is going to come from that uh, lunar robot. When you're uh, when you're all done, you're going to haul it back up there and use it for uh, a power supply on the space station. We'll need one more mission to outfit this uh, habitat uh, for 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 crew and, and you know bringing air up and things of that nature. But uh, this is a, a good start because this is the ma vast majority of the payload. So. What I'm doing is I'm putting uh, a habitat up for about 2,000 persons at any near-Earth orbit location. I start on low lunar orbit, but you can push it around not too hard with that rocket. It's equipped with a full terrestrial gravity simulation. It has cosmic solar radiation shielding, a, a nice thermoelectric power supply and with beam power capability in case you want to you know, use microwaves to beam your power, and a nice uh, convenient rocket that will last for uh, thousands of missions because the reactor uh, lasts about 2,000 hours before we're needing refueling. And that, with that, any uh, near-Earth object, uh, mining, solar power farming, or any other use for the habitat is possible for one cheap and easy mission. And that, is, that concludes my presentation. Um, hopefully, I uh, didn't go too fast, but uh, please, any questions? Thank you. Our study suggests you need about seven tons of water per square meter for shielding. Can, can this work in that, in the, I mean, you, you had one meter, but I was wondering, could it work for seven meters? Because that would be a big deal. Uh, yeah, so you're, if, to do that, you're going to have to have a smaller habitat. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a balance between how big you want your habitat to be and how much water you can get per day off the moon. So any of those combinations are easy. I just wanted to show a, um, you know, the, the lowest possible RPM, so the biggest possible habitat for sure. How long would it take to uh, mine that much water from the surface of the moon? This is only takes 89 trips of that, of that, uh, of that rocket. And it's uh, designed to fill up once per day, so one lunar orbit per day, so just under five months. So um, exactly how much water is it that you're extracting out of the, the lunar surface? Ah, so it's about a million pounds times 90, so 90 million pounds. Okay, and uh, do you, don't you think that maybe that water could be better used, suited for like a lunar base rather than being on a, on a, 
on orbit. Sure. How much water is on the moon? I have no idea. Uh, the best estimates right now is um, 80 billion tons, or 18 billion tons. So this is an itty bitty little fraction oh. of that. So, and that's just on the South Pole, by the way, not like the entire, the entire moon. Which, I mean, they, they've done some analysis recently that they think there's, uh, they found water in the lunar return samples from the Apollo missions. So it's just how do you extract it, right? That's the biggest question. And uh, microwave seems to be the best bet right now. Okay. All right. All Thanks. right, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>